Hey everyone, welcome back to the Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, we'll be talking about some of the Asus 7900 XT and XTX models that were announced in the past couple days. We'll also be going over some unique GPUs, like a blower RTX 4090. That's only two slots. How do they do it? Probably 20,000 RPM. We're not sure, but we'll find out soon. Uh, additionally, we have some news on water blocks for the 7900 series, and we'll be going over a new GPU from a Chinese manufacturer with a completely new silicon design. So let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Lee and Lee's Landcool 3 case. The Landcool 3 has a fully mesh front, good airflow that did well on our thermal testing earlier this year, and it's one of the most mechanically advanced cases we've ever reviewed. The Landcool 3 balances ease of installation features, thermal performance, and cable management in a competitive case market. Learn more at the link in the description below. So with the Radeon 7000 launch now behind us, the partners get their time on the stage to show their partner models of AMD's new RDNA 3 GPUs. And Asus is among the first. They have a card that's in the 7900 XTX series. It's similar in some ways to the Tough. And this particular one is at 3.63 slots of thickness. That's right. It won't fit in cases, unfortunately, that only support 3.62 slot size cards. Uh, and if you have a 3.64 slot size case, then it'll fit just barely. So that's, that's where we are with the slot sizing. Apparently we've decided this is in fact the way we're going to do it now. And uh, apparently the, the point of rounding is going to be the third decimal place. <laughs> so uh, there's your 3.63 slot card. Hopefully that fits for you. For sizing for the actual length of the card, don't worry. They're running that at 352.9 millimeters of length. Once again, it will not fit if you have a case that is 352.8 millimeters. There's absolutely zero variance here. It's exactly on, the, on that first decimal point every single time. The cards are a triple fan design with a die cast metal frame. They have a metal back plate, they have a flow through area, and although Asus hasn't provided pictures of the back yet, we know that it's there. Asus was also keen to point out that another support stick will be included, in case you had any doubts about getting your support stick for your GPU. Although, to be fair, support stick might be a trademarked name from NO3D or whoever it was that announced it last time. Although Asus does have this one for like 50 bucks on Amazon, so there's that. Power delivery of the card is handled by three standard PCIe 8 pins. So that's one more 8 pin than you saw in the reference design from AMD. And that's more than sufficient for a total board power of 350 watts on the XTX. But Asus will probably be running a custom vBIOS. We don't know how much more power it would, it would allow, maybe 400 or something with an overclock. Either way, it's enough pins for all of that. Internally, the Tough features a 17 plus 4 phase VRM. It has unknown current handling capability at present. OC editions will be available alongside the standard ones for an out-of-the-box overclock, but we don't have word on any other models like an ROG Strix, but the future existence of a Strix 7900 XTX is basically guaranteed at this point. Up next, there's a new low for physical games. The re-release for Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, not the remaster or the original Modern Warfare 2, but the second Modern Warfare 2, uh, for console, it contains less than one gigabyte of data on the disk if you buy the physical disk for your device. So it's effectively just a physical license key that requires all of the game data to be downloaded from the internet if you want to actually play it, even the offline modes. So at this point, we've come full circle from having day one paid DLC locked away on the disk along with the game to just not having a game at all. And all of that is within the same franchise. How do they do it? They keep innovating every year. Uh, additionally, this was reported by Does It Play, which is an organization that catalogs the playability of games right out of the box. Does It Play's rank for Modern Warfare 2, the third two, uh, also describes how once you actually download the game, you still can't play campaign mode offline with a local account. You still need a PSN account to do so. Playing offline multiplayer restricts you to just three maps without the ability to change the game mode or customize loadouts. On top of that, co-op mode doesn't work offline, period. When asked what to do if you want to play locally and have some friends over, Activision reportedly said, some, some what? You have what? All of this renders the game literally unplayable for anyone without internet access or just, you know, if you want to play it on the console because it has a campaign mode. 
Even though day one patches are common now, the vast majority of games will still basically function without them, especially if you check does it play. But that's starting to go away as we slip into our cyberpunk dystopian future of not owning anything and paying a licensing fee for literally every single thing that we use. Uh, heated car seats as a recent example. So just mark this as another run on the ladder of our ascent to doom. Next one, uh, right on cue, EK Waterblocks. That's a hell of a transition. Launches its 7900 XTX water block, and this is in its quantum vector squared line. So this one has a block available in the usual clear plexiglass and just full on uh, black acetal with nickel plated copper cold plates. And EK has rotated the cooling engine, as they call it, or the cold plates fins, 90 degrees in order to cool the GCD first and the MCDs second. If you didn't catch our original announcement, the RX 7000 series is a chiplet design with multiple chips in a single package. EK said it also had to up the fin density in order to keep up with the increasing heat density that comes with the territory of smaller die sizes running at equivalent power to previous larger designs. The wraparound backplate is machined in order to get good contact with board components on the backside of the card and features captive screws for ease of assembly and disassembly. There's also EK's branded magnetic terminal covers that make sure the logo is oriented correctly. You know, the important part. Up next, Galax launches its 4090 Hall of Fame card. This is the closest thing we're going to get to a kingpin this generation, sadly. Galax is finally letting its Hall of Fame 4090 out the doors, uh, but it is in a limited capacity, as they always do for these, because they are not particularly high sellers, because they're XOC focused. So, this one has an all-white PCB. The big thing here, though, is, aside from maybe some binning, the power delivery. The Hall of Fame 4090 features a monstrous 28 plus 4 phase VRM. It dominates the board with power components on the left and the right of the GPU core and memory. Caps are all over the place, as usual, even the back, or especially the back, filtering. The Hall of Fame special XOC BIOS will allow the 4090 to go well past 600 watts when the voltage is raised and under extreme cooling conditions like LN2. Because of that, this is the first card we've seen with two 12 volt high power connectors, allowing the card to pull up to 1200 watts of power without passing any official connector radiant. There shouldn't be any cable melting issues here for at least power explicit reasons. And uh, even if you did go past 600 watts on a connector, it can technically take it. It's just a question of the build quality of everything else in the chain. So uh, for this card, the XOC BIOS is going to be the most interesting, or the most important aspect of it, because you can't just increase the power to pull as much as the 212 pins would allow unless the XOC V BIOS is fully unlocked, or at least mostly unlocked. Typically, NVIDIA is pretty, pretty picky about what it allows board partners to do for XOC. The fact that there's two 12 volt high power connectors on here is kind of surprising, honestly, because we had heard previously that NVIDIA was very against this and uh, yet here it is. Maybe they've changed their mind. At this point, at least one extreme overclocker, OGS, who works uh, directly with Galax, has started using the Hall of Fame to break single GPU world records on hardware bot in both Port Royal and GPU Pi under LN2 cooling. The core frequencies achieved are pretty impressive. It's over 3.5 gigahertz in Port Royal and a crazy 3.7 gigahertz in GPU Pi, which is a lighter load and doesn't quite count the same way as 3D, but 3.5 is still pretty good. The Hall of Fame 4090 isn't available for purchase yet. We also don't know what stock cooler it's going to have, uh, but we expect it to be extremely expensive and limited in quality because that's how all of these are always for the Galax Hall of Fame cards. Up next, this story is really interesting at an industry level. So a Chinese company called Moir Chantun is uh, MTT in English, which is More Threads Intelligent Technology, and MTT is launching its new MTT S80 Gaming, which is a new GPU that uses a new GPU design not made by NVIDIA, Intel, or AMD. That's the interesting part. For background, according to Wikipedia, Moore Xiancheng was founded by NVIDIA's former GM for the China region, which is something that Jensen is assuredly not happy about. NVIDIA has the ADA architecture, Intel has Alchemist, AMD has RDNA, and the MTT GPUs run on Twinxiao, which, from what the company claims, will put it in competition with the 3060 Ti for general compute performance. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it will compete in gaming performance. 
uh, or in really any type of workload performance. But compute just as a raw number that you can calculate uh, doesn't necessarily factor for things like drivers or software compatibility. So that's one of the larger aspects here where we've seen it from Intel. You can have GPU silicon and hardware that's pretty competitive, but if it's not competitive basically universally, or at least mostly universally with good driver support, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't have quite the same weight as something from NVIDIA or AMD would as the incumbents in the space at this point. So anyway, the gaming card was photographed with a three fan design. This is all official news from MTT, so it's not rumors. It has a central fan that's smaller, and then the data center card was shown with a simple black and white shroud. The shroud is something that Alienware would probably be jealous of, given that's kind of what it's been trying to do for like a decade with its garbage R13 cases. Data center cards are force-fed air from the case, so that's why there's no included fans, at least that we can see on this particular design. The shroud would just butt up to an intake fan on the case, and that would be that. The official slide for the MTT S80 says that it has 4096 MUSA cores, M-U-S-A, and that in Chinese is from its SUD architecture. But this doesn't mean anything to us, and it's not comparable to CUDA or stream processors, so this will only actually mean something if we have more of these to talk about in the future. GPU speed is 1.8 gigahertz. It runs GDDR6 at 16 gigabytes and has a 256-bit bus. Kind of narrow bus, but uh, pretty good on the capacity. It's PCIe Gen 5 enabled up to buy 16, which makes it the first consumer class card with PCIe Gen 5. RDNA 3 and NVIDIA ADA are both on Gen 4. But to be really clear here, that's totally irrelevant because none of these things are reaching the bandwidth limitations of PCIe Gen 4 by 16, especially not this thing if it's more of a 3060 Ti class card. So just kind of a marketing bullet, and that's about it. Looking at the slide for the MTTS 3000, that runs at 1.9 gigahertz, and it has 32 gigabytes of GDDR6. It also has SRIOV support. Now, additionally, the card also supports AV1. We're not sure just how, like, if it's encode and decode, but supports AV1. They are also cognizant of their CUDA limitations, where since everything's built for CUDA, if it's in data center at least, you have to have some kind of translation layer or compatibility layer in order to be able to use your architecture and card with CUDA if it's not a CUDA card. So uh, MTT did build a, a compatibility layer for CUDA optimized software. That'll probably have some issues like efficiency that we'll never get to test, but they're apparently able to adapt it. This news is mostly significant because there haven't been any major new entrants to GPUs over the years. Actually, it's only shrunken with the losses of Voodoo 3D and basically Matrox, and only one recent addition, which was Intel. And they're a very large company, so it's not really that impressive. Anyway, uh, we'll keep an eye on this one. We don't know if they're going to go anywhere, um, but if, if, if they can actually get to 3060 Ti class performance with drivers that are competitive, uh, although you look at Intel, a massive company with literal decades of experience doing this and how much trouble they've had, we're, we're not really sure that that's going to happen. But if they can come out the gate with a 3060 Ti class card, uh, it'll be relevant pretty fast, depending on price and availability. So anyway, we'll keep an eye on that one, but that's all we have for that. Uh, next one, this story is not that detailed. So there's a card from Manly, which is a, uh, it's actually the same company that launched that card with the level on it. This card is a two-slot blower on a 4090. We expect that the 4090 isn't able to be adequately cooled by the solution, unless maybe it's like a 20k RPM fan and noise levels that would definitely violate OSHA. More interestingly, at this form factor, it's potentially an alternative to NVIDIA's Quadro cards that need to be packed in with higher density. You'd be best off liquid cooling these for two-slot compatibility, and we wouldn't recommend a two-slot blower 4090 anyway. Up next, G-Skill goes over 9,000 for DDR5. So G-Skill is preparing to launch its DDR5-7800 and DDR5-8000 Trident ZZ5 RGB memory kits. And uh, they've been working closely with Asus with the Z790 Maximus Apex in order to do some overclocking and get those over 9,000 numbers. Now, the board they're using retails for $700 and it is specifically tuned for memory overclocking with uh, only two slots, running close to the socket. So you're only running one DIMM per channel, which helps a lot with getting those high memory speeds. And it would be nice to see that feature move down the stack, but for now, it's just here, other than the gene, anyway. While they were at it, the companies wanted to see how far they could push the new RAM. 
which resulted in a final speed of 5,000 megahertz, so that's 10,000 megatransfers per second, and this was done in single channel with a case latency of 50 without special cooling. That calculates to an absolute latency of 10 nanoseconds, which is already attainable by existing kits, but at much lower bandwidth. So as DDR5 matures, it'll be interesting to see how much of an impact the higher frequency kits have on overall performance. AMD is more limited by its rise in 7,000 IMZ than Intel is, topping out at 6,000 to 6,200 megatransfers per second on average anyway. So it's possible, depending on the limitations of the application you're testing, that we could see a wider gap form between the two brands contingent on the memory overclocking and uh, if it's a memory bound application. There have been several DDR5 announcements at this point for speed and they all leapfrog each other, but hitting five digits is a pretty big milestone. Next up, Ryzen Tech is bringing another one of its Morpheus GPU coolers to the market. There are not many GPU coolers aftermarket ones that are available these days. Most of the partners have gotten it together. You can basically just run those. But they're kind of fun projects and they're interesting where you rip everything off the board, you put something different on it instead. And one of the interesting reasons to do this with Ryzen Tech or Arctic previously is because you're basically replacing this whole big plastic bulky shroud from your stock cooling solution with instead just a straight up fin stack and then maybe some 120 mil fans, which give you immense power compared to what might be shipping stock on most of these coolers. Although some of the fans are going up to 116 mil now, so they're pretty close anyway. The new cooler is called the Morpheus 8069, and we're honestly not sure where that number comes from. Uh, Ryzen Tech updates this cooler every couple years to fit newer cards, and the 8069 has support for high-end Radeon RX 6000 cards, maybe that's the 60, as well as Nvidia's 3080, maybe that's the 80, and the 3090, maybe that's the 9. If that's actually how they constructed the product name, then congratulations, you're insane, Ryzen Tech. You've done it. Uh, this consists of a large copper cold plate. It has an aluminum fin stack that is blacked out, it uses six heat pipes, and Ryzen Tech rates it for 360 watts for max support, with the fin stack sitting relatively high off of the surface of the card to help with compatibility. But that also means that when you attach 120 mil fans with the provided clips, the total thickness will be in the same territory as 4090s are already. And then you also have to be careful to make sure there's contact to other components that might need contact, like MOSFETs. The cooler also comes with copper and aluminum heat sinks to attach to other heat producing components like power stages. Previous Morpheus coolers also use this approach for the VRAM. But the 8069 has RAM coverage built into the cold plate. That gives us concern about compatibility with some models that may have taller components around the die area. Uh, we actually ran into this problem fitting an LN2 pot to a 4090 in our last OC live stream, but we'd have to test it to really know. And honestly, we probably won't test this one. Now, historically, these types of aftermarket coolers have mostly been good for upfitting an aero type card where it's just a blower fan, kind of like that one we were talking about earlier from Manly, where you're ripping off a cheap garbage tier cooler that allowed the card to sell at MSRP and you're replacing it with something far better. That's where they made the most sense. There's not a lot of that right now in the market for the 40 series. Maybe the RDNA 3 stuff will have some cheaper models where it's actually worth removing the stock cooler, but this would have to be adapted forward for that because uh, it would need to obviously redesign the cold plate and it would need different whole spacing as well, probably. We don't know the whole spacing yet. So anyway, uh, Scythe is the other company that used to do these. Arctic still does, and that's kind of it for aftermarket solutions. Next up, Arctic MX-5 is dead, but Arctic MX-6 is coming out now. The company launched its new MX-6 thermal paste onto the market, replacing the still relatively new MX-5, which is discontinued immediately. We're not exactly sure why that is, but MX-5 had some QC issues and uh, issues off the line that have probably plagued its reputation at this point. They've tried to fix it. Not sure if they fully fixed those issues or not, but either way, maybe they're just looking at it as this is kind of a dead product. We need to get rid of this thing and launch something new. So that's what MX-6 is. Uh, the marketing is a little bit strange. They say that the MX-6 paste is, quote, simply the paste. Okay. I wasn't expecting like LEDs in it, so I'm not really sure what else we'd be going for. Uh, it then says that there's no burn-in period, which is valid. Technically, most thermal pastes have maybe like a 24-hour period where uh, they sort of soak and the performance changes a little bit. And then it also says that the uh, lack of expensive or precious metals like diamond powder that you find in some of these pastes obviously means it's not going to be electrically conductive, 
only thermally conductive. So for component safety, you don't have much to worry about with that. The new MX6 paste is aimed at being suitable for all applications with good thermal conductivity and a lawn service life, they say, of eight years. One interesting note is that Arctic claims the viscosity of the new paste is so high that it'll prevent the pump-out effect. If you don't know, the pump-out effect is from the very minor expansion contraction that happens at the device being cooled and at the cold plate, where over time you get a slight pumping effect of the two ends of uh, what's being contacted by the TIM or the thermal interface material. And over time, in theory, you can have that paste kind of work its way out of the area it was applied and introduce some gaps in coverage. So that's what that is. They're saying this resists that, which is a good thing. Uh, normally, it's the, the really liquidy paste where you have pump out effect to actually be a concern. Arctic's new paste will be in two gram, four gram, and eight gram quantities. And we expect to have many new syringes laying around the office soon for thermal paste, just, just to be very clear about that. So we'll let you know if we find anything interesting with the MX6 stuff. All right, next one, a monitor for the case side panel. Yes, yes, actually, this is what ASRock's engineers have been hard at work with. It's a monitor that goes on the side of your case. We've seen a recent trend of monitors going on just about everything. We've seen on water blocks, video cards, liquid coolers, motherboards for sure, power supplies. I don't think we've seen it on RAM yet, but it'll happen. Now we've got it for the case side panel. So this is a 13.3 inch 60 hertz IPS 1080p display. It uses adhesive mounting brackets. Great, that'll be good when they get hot. And an embedded display port cable. If you've never heard of embedded display port or you wonder how you'd connect it to a desktop without running a cable in an ugly fashion, we don't blame you. What they're using is a really flat implementation of the DisplayPort connector cable that's capable of delivering power as well as data. And it's normally used in laptops and similarly space constrained devices as a ribbon cable. The one that ships with this kit is round though, and it looks a little bit handmade. ASRock has been quietly adding embedded display port to some of its recent motherboards, but it hasn't been clear as to why until now. One thing that isn't clearly stated here is that if you're going to use embedded display port, you'll need an IGP in the CPU that you're using it with. So I mean, anything modern for the most part, but the F SKUs, for example, from Intel wouldn't work with this at least as we understand it right now. ASRock claims that its screen will quote, this is an actual quote, double your productivity. Not really sure how that works. Uh, you had a 13.3 inch screen in addition to your whatever 28 inch display and you turn your head 90 degrees and look at it. Not sure where the doubling is coming from, but once again, okay. Also, if we look at the marketing images for this, it looks like the guy on the left of the stock photo is recursively editing himself in the very same image he appears in. So that's pretty cool. And the guy on the right is like ready to lay some bars or something. We're not really sure who dresses up to play games like that and then leaves their headphones on the table. But once again, okay. Uh, this is a silly kind of product because people typically get clear side panels so they can actually see the parts in their computer. This is covering them up. It entirely defeats the purpose, and transparent LCDs like the Snowblind make more sense for a showcase build. So this is really bizarre. We are genuinely very curious what your thoughts are on this. There's probably actual use cases for it. Uh, most likely, the, the better ones are not going to be for productivity, but for displaying something cool on the panel that is related to the build. Um, definitely don't see the doubling here, though. Uh, not really sure that ASRock is aware you can have two monitors without one being inside of the case on the glass. Uh, so anyway, next up, cable mod and 12 volt high power connector angled adapter updates. So we previously talked about cable mod prepping a 90 degree adapter for the 12 volt high power cables. And this is for video cards, obviously running the 16 pin or the 12 plus four is really what it is. And now there's an update. The pre-sale launch is delayed until sometime in the future nebulously stated as cable mod works on compatibility with different board partners. Additionally, thinner 180 degree versions are being prepared to give the option for the cable to be routed back towards the motherboard on either side of the cart, just like with the 90 degree version. These are in one fixed orientation and not swappable. There are four total versions here. Kale mod is building a list of confirmed compatibility below each model on its landing page, designating whether the cable will come out on the backplate side or the cooler side of the cart. 
This is important because if it were to go ahead and launch, there would likely be a lot of customers ending up with an incompatible or undesired version for their card. Just to clarify further here, so the connector on the video card on the PCB, it's not standardized if it's forward or backwards. It's the same as eight pins. This isn't new. So some of them run the uh, sense side towards the back of the card. Some of it run towards the front of the card. That's going to impact how the cable is positioned, obviously. And it would suck if it went like 180 degrees the wrong direction. And then additionally, the uh, housing for the connectors on the PCB is a little different from some runs to the next. So ASUS fully encases the sense and NVIDIA does not, for example. So uh, that's what they're working on. The company says that it will allow people who sign up for one version to switch before general launch four to six weeks from now in case the customer's needs change. And uh, it's also a good move because it'll just reduce a lot of issues. We don't know the final pricing for the angled adapters, but there does seem to be a lot of interest. Last one, AlphaCool is launching open loop water cooling kits under the Core Storm and Core Wind branding. Maybe it's Core Wind. Uh, anyway, it's going to be with variously sized radiators, and they're selling this to be an open loop kit, which you, you just buy the whole kit, and then you get most of the stuff out of the box. Not a new idea. We've seen it plenty of times in the past. Thermal Take did it with uh, a pretty large amount of options in the past. But there's renewed interest in water cooling now, which is good, because the 40 series and um, the Intel and AMD CPUs both right now, they're all kind of in a in a situation where water cooling is going to be the easiest way to get the noise levels down and cool everything adequately. AlphaCool's kits are comprised of all the parts necessary to create an expandable CPU-only loop with radiator and fans, CPU block, pump, and all the fittings, and they're all compatible. One of the fittings is a quick disconnect, which allows easier future expansion for another GPU or a block or something or a radiator without draining. Core Wind is the lower end, Core Storm is the higher end. There's pretty big gaps in pricing between them. Both use only copper and brass parts from AlphaCool's regular DIY lines. And on AlphaCool's website, they range from 250 to 430 euros. That's it for the news this week. Thanks for watching, as always. Subscribe for more. We're working on a lot of other stories right now. There's tons of stuff going on, not just follow-up benchmarking. By the way, check our Ryzen Efficiency uh, Eco Mode piece. It's really cool. Some interesting data in there. But we also have some research pieces and some investigations. So tune in for all that. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.